guest today, Professor Doris Gray. Doris is an associate professor in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at Al Akhawin University uh, in Morocco. Prior to this appointment, she spent some time teaching in the departments of modern language and women, women's studies uh, in, uh, at Florida State University. She holds a Master's of Journalism from Florida A&M University and a PhD in French and Francophone Studies from Florida State University. Um, as a journalist, uh, Doris spent years covering North and Sub-Saharan Africa as a correspondent for uh, Die Welt, uh, the German Press Agency, The Voice of America, uh, the BBC, and other news organizations. Her areas of interest uh, as a scholar uh, and as a public intellectual include feminism and Islam, women's activism, post-colonial studies, and justice and the legal system, particularly in North Africa. She has written extensively on these topics, and she is the author of Muslim Women on the Move, uh, Women in Morocco and France Speak Out, published in 2008, and Beyond Feminism and uh, Islamism and Feminism, Gender and Equality in North Africa, which was published last year. Today, she will expand on uh, this latter work uh, in a lecture titled Beyond Islamism and Feminism, Gender and Equality in North Africa. Please join me in welcoming Professor Doris Greitenberg. Good afternoon, friends and strangers. <laughs> um, thank you to Emily Gottreich for inviting me. That was very kind. And to Lydia for making various and sundry arrangements. Um, I live in the Atlas Mountains, so I thought I was used to four seasons in a day. But I think San Francisco takes it to a whole new level. You have them even four seasons two miles apart. <laughs> so if I start taking off jackets, it's just because the climate has changed in the room. Um, as uh, Professor Nizar was saying, I'm, I came to academia after a long career in journalism as a foreign correspondent for the German press agency in 10 years in sub-Saharan Africa. So my perspective on North Africa is really shaped by my African experience more than by my Middle Eastern experience. Um, and also when you work as a journalist, you focus on contemporary issues and you are trained to ask questions. And that is what carried me over into academia. Um, so I work mostly on contemporary issues and most of my research is people-centered or people-oriented. And the question that interested me here that uh, comes to this talk is the issue of gender justice, gender equality, how this is being approached uh, in Morocco today. We often associate like the achievements of women's rights with Western societies and forget that the discussions on gender justice or gender equality in Muslim majority countries is just as vigorous, probably more vigorous than we have them in Western secular societies. Um, in Morocco, not a week goes by when some newspaper or television station or radio program doesn't have some kind of emission on uh, gender issues, women's rights issues. In the West, we mostly hear of women's rights issues when they are being broken. Like uh, in Morocco, the most recent case probably that you are familiar with is the case of Amina Filali, this 16-year-old girl who was forced to marry her rapist and then swallowed rat poisoning and killed herself. And I'm happy to report that the paragraph in the Moroccan Penal Code, paragraph 475, that allows a rapist to go free if the court or the parents um, convinced the girl to the victim to marry her perpetrator, it was unanimously scrapped. So that no lo law no longer is on the books. However, as often is the case, these laws are sort of just the tip of the iceberg. And one law gets changed, and many others who are equally discriminatory don't get changed. And then actually, these reforms create bigger problems than they solve. For example, this particular law has been used by girls to marry the boy of their dreams by saying he raped me and therefore petitioned a court to force him to marry her. And the reason for that is that in Morocco, sex outside of marriage is illegal, it's a criminal offense, and that law has not been changed. So it's often a way of protecting women um, 
to being prosecuted for sex outside of marriage. These laws never get applied to men, so for some reason, these women are always having sex with imaginary male partners. Um, so just the fact that that law has been changed is some kind of progress, but unless other laws change as well, it's probably um, doesn't really solve a whole lot of uh, problems. Um, underlying all of these laws are cultural and social norms, which in Morocco are often perceived as being rooted in Islam. And young Moroccans in particular want to understand what it means to be modern, what it means to be uh, a believing Muslim, what it means to be a non-believing Muslim, what it means to be an atheist, what it means to be a traditionalist in a society that has a state-prescribed religion, where these kinds of discussions can't be um, had in public, um, where conversion to another religion is a criminal offense. So young people are faced with fairly existential questions, how to lead their lives in accordance with what kind of principles, if these are principles that they uh, embrace but that are not uh, sanctioned by, by the monarchy. And gender, in my view, provides a lens to look at a lot of social issues, political issues, societal issues. And it seems that there's sort of two approaches. Some People would like to have change, even so it's not very clear what kind of change is being envisioned. And others fear a disintegration of society if uh, the gender situation, the gender balance changes. Even if people are very ag acknowledging of the injustices perpetuated against women, at least they provide some stability and people know where they stand vis-a-vis -vis the law or within the culture. And I would, of course, say that the discourse on women's rights is not necessarily about what women want or not want, because women are not a homogeneous population. But it's really more what kind of direction an entire country is going in. And the gender question is always central in uh, the uh, path forward for any kind of country. In Morocco, of course, one of the critical aspects in that uh, discussion is that there is no demarcation line between religion and uh, the public sphere. Um, there, it's a state religion. The king has the dual function as head of government, head of state, and commander of the faithful. He's also the highest religious authority in the kingdom. And in highly patriarchal societies, such as Morocco, North Africa in general, Patriarchy is seen by all gender rights activists as a major stumbling block or by proponents of gender justice. What is often seen less of a stumbling block is authoritarianism, which goes hand in glove with patriarchy. And uh, just to give you an example, women's rights organizations replicate authoritarian structures and are very rarely really democratic, internally democratic institutions. They are very rigidly uh, run organizations. And if there is disagreement, the disagreement on the gender discourse is often not on ideological grounds, but they are personality conflicts. And so when several strong women with different views collide, one breaks off and starts another association. Um, so there really is no consensus on what constitutes gender justice in uh, Morocco at this point. We often hear of this dichotomy between secular women's rights advocate and Islamist women's rights advocates. And what I find is, first of all, that that dichotomy really uh, is not accurate. Um, all the secular rights women's advocates in Morocco are Muslims. They fast during Ramadan. So what constitutes secular is fairly questionable. And on the other end, what is an Islamist, I think, is really not very satisfactorily uh, defined. Islamist is anything from Al-Qaeda to the Muslim Brotherhood to the moderate Nahda party in Tunisia to Al-Atlwa Isahan in Morocco. 
all of these groups are called Islamists. So I try to actually not really use the term Islamist because I think it's, we don't really know what we are talking about when we use that term. Um, the discussion on gender uh, rights issues at the moment in Morocco are actually more vividly within more religiously um, based organizations. More so than in the more secularly minded organizations because more secular organizations are very oriented towards the West. They have the same discourse on on feminist questions, on women's rights questions, as we have in the West. Whereas within religious organizations, there is much more of a, a discussion going on how gender rights can be justified by a religious reinterpretation of uh, sacred texts. The most, and I might just bring that in now, one of the most interesting debates is going on right now. I don't know if some of you may have followed it. The complete implosion of the feminist, the feminine section of al Atlwa Isahan, the uh, justice and charity movement, after the death of the sheikh. His daughter was supposed to uh, be in a prominent leadership uh, position. And the, she, was, she had built a very vigorous women's section, the most active women's section of any um, religious organization, in fact, and it's completely been dismantled by the new leadership that came up in uh, the wake of her father's death. She is in hiding, she doesn't answer phones, she's not talking to anybody, but she's doing and trying to figure out which step to, to take next, next. And one of the steps that has been taken is that many of the women have left the movement and are starting organizations and associations of their own um, with different focus, some education, some political, some uh, social service oriented, and they are discussing how, how to reconcile notions of gender equality or gender justice with an Islamic um, or more a traditional doctrinal interpretation. Um, I'd like to come back maybe in time a little bit to um, just to make sure we understand that these discussions in Morocco are not new at all. I came across a book written in 1935 by a legal scholar, Tahar Asafi, who wrote in 1935, and I'm going to quote a little bit from his book, um, to be a feminist is first and foremost wanting dignity for women dignity through freedom, dignity through equality. North Africans should not be terrified by these concepts. However, evolution prog progresses slowly. So this was written 80 years ago. And yes, progress has been very slow. Um, he also wrote, the condition of Arab women, the woman in Islam has always been confused, mixed in with all sorts of other problems. Questions about Islam, are, so to say, a la mode, just as is the question of the veil, polygamy, and emancipation. Again, this was written 80 years ago, and if we think about where women's rights issues were 80 years ago in the United States, I think in Morocco they were actually discussing things we didn't even think about yet at that time in the, uh, in the Western world. So, to come back to um, the discussions on uh, the gender discourse in more religiously minded organizations or associations. Uh, I have come to use the term third way, and I'll tell you why I do that. We hear a lot about Islamic feminism, and like with Islamists, I think it doesn't really capture what Islamic feminism really is, because it's different in Turkey from how it is in Indonesia, how it is in Morocco. So it's not a really coherent ideology or a co coherent vision or conceptualization of gender rights. So I, when it comes to Morocco, I use the term third way. And by third way, what I mean is women who basically agree whether they are more religiously inclined or whether they're more um, uh, secularly inclined, they agree that there are some common universal values pertaining to human rights and to gender rights. Um, that there are certain points of 
uh, of gender issues that no matter where you stand ideologically, you can agree on. For example, domestic violence or sexual harassment. You don't have to be on the left or on the right to agree that that is a problem that needs to be resolved. And sexual harassment at the moment in Morocco is a very uh, acute problem because after the, uh, the paragraph 475 was scrapped, immediately the next discussion came, uh, Morocco needs to have sexual harassment laws. So that is the discussion that is being uh, uh, in Parliament at the moment. Um, in the West, we usually talk about women's rights or women's equality. F for more religiously minded people, those are a little bit problematic terms because none of the religious scriptures, whether it's the Bible or the Quran, contain the term equality that doesn't exist in any sacred scripture. The concept of equality doesn't exist in sacred scriptures. But what does exist in sacred scriptures, and especially in the Quran, is the concept of justice. So many more religiously inclined um, gender rights activists talk about gender justice rather than gender equality for the very reason that the term justice resonates whereas the term equality sounds foreign or Western. Um, there also has been much discussion about another term that is often misinterpreted in the West, complementarity. Um, many religiously inclined women's rights activists or gender justice activists prefer to use the term complementarity to equality and it has often been interpreted, especially in the wake of the discussions of the rewriting of the uh, Tunisian constitution, because it was, was a term that was supposed to be in there as well. It's often translated as women complementing men. When what is really being meant, at least by the people I've talked to, it's that male and female need to complement each other. And gender justice is a justice that is inclusive, inclusive of male and female and one cannot exist without the other. Um, again, the term complementarity goes back to the scriptures um, when God created men and women, etc., etc. So it's again a term that has more cultural resonance than the term equality. Um, part of what religiously inclined gender justice activists uh, emphasize is a rereading of the sacred texts with a view of bringing out the verses that emphasize the equality of human beings. Um, not only, and the equality of human beings regardless of who they are. And I'm saying this because when I talk with um, more religiously inclined gender justice activists, the topic often gets, or very quickly gets, to minority rights. So we advocate for gender justice, and then we also have to advocate for minority rights. And then, of course, that me being Western, they say, we know where you're going, you're going to go down the road of gay rights. And I said, yeah, of course, eventually I'm going to go down that road. So what do you say about that? And uh, several very uh, religious, religiously inclined gender justice activists have told me recently that they're really wrestling with this. That from a religious perspective, they can't really approve of gay rights. But if they truly embrace the concept of human rights or universal human rights, it will eventually have to include that. And I, I find that it's very remarkable, especially if you look from an American conservative perspective. I don't think American conservatives would be very open to say we really uh, are looking at a gay rights discourse and how that fits in with our overall picture on human rights. Whereas these organizations or these associations are saying these are things we are looking at and we are wrestling with that. We haven't made a decision yet, but we are discussing them. 
and we are trying to figure out what to do about these questions. Um, and I think part of that has to do with that in the past it was very much the leftists that were persecuted in Morocco and imprisoned and tortured, etc. And in more recent Moroccan history, it was the Islamists that were persecuted and partially, partly imprisoned. So they have the experience of being on the other end of human rights abuses. And therefore, when they say we, uh, we embrace a human rights agenda, they know it's, it is uh, intended to uh, embrace a larger agenda than what they're really willing to accept, but they're working their way towards that. Um, there was a study a couple of uh, years ago done in Morocco, um, and that's sort of the origin of these uh, third way ideas. There was a survey done where uh, people were asked what was the most difficult aspect about their religion? What did they perceive as being the most difficult aspect about their religion? If they had to say something was difficult about their religion. And the overwhelming, I think 90% of the respondents said it's the fear of asking questions. Um, and that there were many aspects of Islam that troubled them, but they didn't want to, be, didn't want to risk being unfaithful and therefore left certain questions rather unasked, and also didn't want to be labeled as a disbeliever. And uh, therefore, any kind of discussion about gender justice or gender rights, unless it's framed within a religiously acceptable context, it will be very difficult for the majority of the population to accept that. Even so, if somebody is persecuted or oppressed or discriminated against, you don't have to tell them that they're discriminated against. They know that they are. But they often accept this as the will of God rather than um, embracing an, an ideology that may be in theory better for them, but in practice would cause them more problems. And so there has been this movement in Morocco to interpret the scripture um, in such a way that makes gender justice acceptable within a Muslim majority context. Um, a very important part of that reinterpretation is to def redefine women as uh, as agents in their own right. Most of the time, interpretations of the Quran would say women exist as relational beings, as daughters, as sisters, as wives. And that's their primary form of identity. And these uh, reinterpretations of the Quran are trying to emphasize that from a, a divine point of view, women are as much endowed with being masters of their own lives as men are. And that the relational, the emphasis on relationship is an interpretation but is not actually rooted in the text. So that women are scripturally justified in asserting being independent and autonomous human beings. So the emphasis is on pointing out that the Quran does not portray women as a subspecies of humans, but who, like men, are endowed with the same rights to freedoms and individual agencies. Agency. Um, another aspect of uh, the, re the third way is uh, the project of secularizing the state. And this might sound strange coming from a religious or from an Islamist perspective, if you will. But part of the reasoning for that is that because Morocco has a monarchic Islam, our moderate royal Islam, and that's the only Islam that is really publicly discussed, people who have a different interpretation of Islam, of which there are many, um, find it very hard to uh, exist in this new pluralistic uh, 
The reality is pluralistic, but the discourse is still very monarchic. And so the peop several people would argue that unless we separate state and religion and secularize the state, Muslims themselves are not free to practice Islam in the way they want to practice it. And so it's not the French laïc, the French laïcité concept, but it's really much more the American understanding of secular society, meaning protection of different religious expressions, not suppression of different religious um, expressions. Um, which I think is also interesting that we would not often associate Islamist discourse with advocating uh, a secular state, but that seems to be more and more uh, common. Um, I'd like to just talk about a few people who are, just so you know where I'm getting my information from, some of the women that are propagating this so-called third way. One of them is Asma Lam Rabet. She's a medical doctor who is the wife of a diplomat and spent a long time in South America while her husband was um, ambassador in different Central and South American countries. And uh, um, in Central and South America, she came across liberation theology and was very inspired by what liberation theology did for social activism within the Christian context and thought there could be something like liberation theology within Islam. And then started from being a very secular, almost atheist person to saying, I'm going to study my own religion and see if I can come up with some kind of liberation theology kind of model within Islam. And she has written several books now on reinterpretation of Islam. And then the king noticed that she was getting more and more uh, popular and then has uh, made her part of the uh, ulema, the uh, council of um, uh, the Mohammedan Council of uh, Religious Scholar in Morocco. There is a feminine section now that uh, she is heading. Which, of course, uh, those of you who know Morocco know this, this is a way of the king to appropriating this new discourse as his own bright, brilliant idea. Um, but nevertheless, he's allowing these discussions to go forward. The other person that's very much thinking about uh, gender justice issues, as I mentioned earlier, is Nadia Yassin, the daughter of Sheikh Yassin, who has had been heading the uh, feminine section of, of uh, Al Atwa Isahan Justice and Charity Movement. Um, while she was leading the movement, one of the things that she was very much encouraging is continuing education. And so many of the women in her movement in their third, well, 40s and 50s, were sponsored to go and get uh, university degrees. And as it's very uncommon in Morocco for men and women to return to college after they had raised families, they were sponsored to study in France and in Belgium and some went to the US. And then these women came back to Morocco in their 50s which, with graduate degrees. And now that the feminist feminine section of Al Atl has been disbanded, they are on their own organizing new associations themselves, um, trying to apply their knowledge or their expertise. Um, some have started uh, like counseling, also um, uh, a profession that's not very widespread in Morocco, but some of these women came back from Europe and they got uh, degrees in psychology and started counseling services. Um, Another person that I think is very interesting in this whole gender justice uh, thinking is Miriam Yafoud. She was a leading member in Al Atal before and left several years ago before the death of the Sheikh and is now a political scientist who is doing a lot of writing and research on gender justice um, issues within Morocco. All of this, I think, is to say that um, the discourse on women's rights in Morocco is very vibrant and is most active in more conservative religious circles than it is in more so-called modern Western circles. And of course, the big elephant in the room is the Arab revolutions. You know, what happened in Tunisia and uh, Egypt and Libya. 
Morocco is watching what is happening in these laborat laboratories. Um, but it's creating a lot of pressure on Morocco to move forward with some agenda, and women's rights agenda is one of them, um, to diffuse some of the tensions that are in the country. And many of the tensions are around these gender issues. So even so, the Arab revolutions haven't reached Morocco, there is within Morocco very diverse and divergent thinking on many of these issues. And I just shed some light, hopefully, on, um, on the gender question. Um, I think, I just want to conclude with that. One of the reasons why the gender discourse is always so uh, hotly discussed is because everybody feels they can weigh in on that discourse. Because everybody has a mother, everybody has a sister, everybody has a wife, everybody has a niece. Everybody is related in some way, shape or form to a woman. And so everybody has a vested interest, which is maybe not so much the case when you're talking about economic issues or political issues, but when it comes to women, everybody feels they have a stake in the matter. And so this is a particularly hot issue that if countries can resolve the question of gender, they can resolve many other questions that, um, questions of injustice or human rights in the process. But they're the most difficult questions to resolve because there is just so many uh, uh, pulling and pushing forces on these issues. Um, so what I would like to conclude with saying is when we're looking at Muslim majority countries such as Morocco, we should maybe pay a little bit more attention to what is going on in the religious circles and not feel so comfortable that as Westerners to sort of naturally align ourselves with more Western or secular associations, but look at where the discussions are really coming from, where they are most vibrant and where there are new ideas being formulated. I think that's what I have to say for the moment. <laughs>